Hey there, and welcome back to Utility Sports. And today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the second round NFL mock draft. And if you are interested in a jersey giveaway, we are giving away a Trevor Lawrence, Jacksonville Jaguar black jersey on the channel. And as that progresses, we do encourage you to subscribe and also leave a comment to enter in this sweepstakes. So if you're at all interested in possibly getting a free jersey, that's a great way to do it. Now, Sheldon, we are sitting here at pick 33 with Jacksonville. And who are you really eyeing? Yeah, at this point, they've already addressed that quarterback spot with pick number one, obviously. And they came back and addressed their defensive line with their second first round pick. So here's got to be about the secondary and improving that secondary. And they're going to go look at the safety position and grab Trayvon Merrick here. I think that he is the obvious uh, pick for them at this point. That is their biggest positional need in my estimation. I think Trayvon Merrick is a really good solution to that problem. Yeah, I really like that for Jacksonville, getting a guy like Trayvon Merrick, who very well could still be a first-round selection. At pick 34, we have the New York Jets. They were obviously addressed the quarterback and corner position in that first round, which leaves the door kind of open for the wide receiver position, possibly. I know a lot of people are getting higher on Elijah Moore as time progresses, but for me, I think Aziz Ojolari fits in great with the New York Jets. Considering they did cut Henry Anderson, they do need to replace that edge spot. And to me right now, Ojolari is actually my edge number one. So getting him at pick 34 is very, very good for the New York Jets. Yeah, definitely. This is a wide open edge class. There's going to be a lot of variation there uh, among boards. And I think Robert Saul is going to really value getting that edge position really dialed in and figured out there in New York, whether that's through free agency or the draft. I think Ojolari is going to go a long way in helping the New York Jets really improve as a football team. At 35 here, I got the Atlanta Falcons and I'm looking at ways that I can really improve this football team. And I'm actually going to opt for Zayvon Collins here. I think he's the most impactful player still on the board. He's going to give you a variation of what, what he's able to do really on, on that defense. He's able to get after the, after the quarterback. He's a little bit of a pass rusher, gives you some optionality as an outside linebacker, can play weak side, can play off the ball as well. It was really key to what Tulsa did this year. And I think grabbing him at 35 is very good value. Yeah, I think for Atlanta, it's all about getting possibly the best player available. So I definitely think that makes sense for Atlanta to go in that linebacker spot. And at 36, we have Miami, which they addressed the wide receiver and tackle position in that first round. I think they're actually going to come back again, possibly with offense, or they're going to look at the edge spot. Jason Away, who is arguably the second most athletic uh, edge rusher in this class, is still available here at 36, but they also could look at the running back position. And I think that's ultimately where they're going to opt and go with Javante Williams, arguably the best running back on the board. Uh, in a lot of people's eyes, but I have a little more of a preference towards Kenneth Gainwell just with his ability in the past game, but I really like Javante Williams at 36. Yeah, Javante Williams, one of my favorites in this class. You know how much I like those UNC running backs, both him and Michael Carter. Uh, and I think Miami uh, is a great place for him as well. They really need to uh, improve their run game, both on the offensive line, buying a tackle, right guard as well. And also bringing in a real running back there, Javante Williams is going to be a great solution for them. 37, got the Philadelphia Eagles, Eagles here. They addressed that pass catching need going with a tight end in round one. Now at this point, I want to take a look at the linebacker position here. And I think that this is maybe the highest we're going to see a guy like uh, him go in one of these mock drafts. I'm going to offer Jabril Cox here out of LSU. He is the best pass coverage linebacker on the board yet at this point. I think that's a really big need there for Philadelphia. They're going to have to be dealing with the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Giants. Washington football team they need to have some pass coverage in there Jabril Cox is going to go a long way in that he's a very versatile linebacker and I, I think he's going to rise up boards as we move closer to the NFL draft absolutely I think Jabril Cox is is definitely one of the best pass cover linebackers if not the best I think it, it was really understated how well he played last year at LSU considering that their entire defense was, was pretty brutal as a whole but he was that low and bright spot for them and now we have Cincinnati here at 38. Obviously, they took a wide receiver in the first round. I think they're going to come back and take a look at that tackle position. Dylan Raddins from North Dakota State really makes a lot of sense for them. You have to protect, protect Joe Burrow. And ultimately, they get themselves either a left or a right tackle. It really depends on you know where they're more comfortable having Jonah Williams. Right, yeah, Raddins, I like that Austin a lot for Cincinnati. And at 39 now, I've got the Carolina Panthers. I want to look at the, take a look at the cornerback position specifically. They really missed James Bradbury when he departed for the New York Giants. And they're going to have to come back and find a way to replace him. They're going to go with Kelvin Joseph here out of Kentucky. He's a guy, he's also been rising up for as of late. He's a guy who's capable of undercutting routes. I think that he's a little bit 
conservative over the top he doesn't really take a lot of chances but when he does he is very uh consistent and very very effective at doing so now will his talent really proceed to the nfl i'm not sure i think that there's gonna be a little bit of questions about if he can deal with uh nfl bigger body receivers he is six foot one he's got a good frame to him uh but i think that he was a little bit more physically composed than some of his counterparts there when he was playing at kentucky but i think at 39 this is worth the risk for carolina and once again, this is one of those later risers we see throughout the draft process. And a lot of these these big boards like they have here obviously go off of what the analysts or quote experts are saying. That's why, you know, sometimes when you hear a name get hot, obviously they rise up these these rankings. So very interesting at 39 for Carolina. They definitely need that cornerback spot. And we're sitting here at 40 with the Denver Broncos. I think it comes down to the linebacker or edge spot. But for me personally, I do think that they are going to prioritize getting Nick Bolton, who's um, arguably the best player between those two positions. I think Denver's going to want to continue to build that defense up. Obviously, it was a little lackluster this year, but they definitely need to uh, continue to build up what they've been working towards. Yeah, definitely. I, I like Nick Bolton there in Denver. They get a better linebacker moving forward. And at 41, I got the Detroit Lions. I want to take a look again at the offensive tackles available here in this class. And I'm actually going to opt for Alex Leatherwood at this point. I think that this is just a safe direction for the Detroit Lions to go. I think that they're going to take this rebuild slow, really focus on building up the trenches there under their new head coach. And I think that they're going to prioritize winning at the line of scrimmage. Alex Leatherwood is a very safe pick in doing so. Yeah, I think Dan Campbell is really going to prioritize winning the trenches, and that's something that Detroit didn't do a whole lot of last year or even really in years past as well. So I think they definitely need to look at that offensive front and address that. F42 with the New York Giants will be looking at that edge spot. And this is a player that I definitely think has tremendous upside with his athleticism, Jason Away, but at the same time, he does not have a lot of pass rushing moves after really watching his film. Uh, he, he really relies a lot on his athleticism, but um, this is this is possibly a player that could be really, really good or extremely bad at the next level. He will be the selection for the New York Giants, just considering that I, I think they are going to bank on some upside there. Yeah, definitely. I like that a lot for New York and 43, we got the 49ers here and they're going to go with Asante Samuel Jr. here, the uh, versatile cornerback, someone who can also, like his father, play a little aggressively, be a little bit of a playmaker on defense there coming from Florida State. And I think that looking at San Francisco, they badly need to find a Richard Sherman replacement. Asante Samuel Jr. is going to be the precedent there for the 49ers. They need to really address this defense. I think they're going to miss their former defensive coordinator, Robert Sala. So I think a lot of focus is going to go onto that defense this offseason and finding ways to improve despite key losses. Yeah, I think it's almost a guarantee that the 49ers take a cornerback within the first two rounds, and Asante Samuel obviously addresses that need. <clears throat> but I do think that, you know, some, there's some other corners on the board that they might consider. It's all going to be based off of preference for sure. Asante Samuel Jr., though, very well could be the best out of that grouping. And now we have the Dallas Cowboys, who I think they definitely have to go with that interior defensive line. I think a guy like Davion Nixon definitely makes a lot of sense, or Levi uh, on Wuzu Rookie. I, I think that's probably going to be the pick. I've seen a lot more of on Wuzu Rookie, just considering that um, he has been he has been one of those later risers as well. A guy that was thought to be a possible third or fourth round talent has propelled himself at the middle of the second round. Um, I definitely think Dallas needs that interior presence. Yeah, I like that a lot for Dallas. Now with Jacksonville here, you know, interior, uh, the slot cornerback position, not as much of a need. They got a deal done with, with Trey Herndon there. So I think that they're going to wait a year on really trying to figure out how to address that long term. Instead here, they're going to go with Pat Fryermuth out of Penn State at tight end. Some are likening him to a baby Gronk. I don't necessarily see that. However, I still see it very likely that Jacksonville would look in that direction to try and figure out that tight end position long term. They're bringing in Trevor Lawrence. They need to find ways to surround him with talent. Pat Fryermuth is going to help them in that regard. Yeah, I think that is uh, a very, very obvious pick for them at 45. They definitely want to go ahead and get a tight end because their tight end group is arguably the worst in the league right now. Urban Meyer said that is going to be something they address moving forward for sure is that tight end spot. And if they aren't able to get it done in free agency, I guess we'll see this week. But if they aren't able to, they will go with Friar Muth at 45. At 46, I think this is another team on tight end watch. I think Brevin Jordan goes right after 
I, I definitely think Brevin Jordan has high upside. He's a really good athlete at the tight end spot. And if we look at a lot of the prototypical tight ends, a lot of guys that, you know, are pretty good athletes overall, we see guys like Noah Fant and George Kittle, Travis Kelsey, very, you know, very, very good athletes for their position. Brevin Jordan is going to be a success story in New England, in my opinion. Yeah, I think New England would definitely prefer to get Fryermuth just based on how he plays the position, more of a true blocker and pass catcher, where Brevin Jordan's more of an athlete, Austin. I know you spend a lot of time looking at the tight ends here. Which one of these two do you really have a preference for at this point? I think this is a, a not common take, but I, I would rather go with Brevin Jordan just considering the prototypical tight end, a guy that I think Brevin Jordan can be a six to 700 yard uh, receiver at that tight end spot. I don't say Friar Muth as the same. However, where Friar Muth has the, the upside is the red zone. And also like you had previously mentioned his ability to block in the run game. So that's kind of the differences between those two. And it's all based off of preference. But I think if those two were picking tight ends, that's kind of how that would look. Yeah, definitely. And now at 47, we got the Los Angeles Chargers here. They grabbed a tackle round one. Round two is going to be still focused on that offensive line. They had so many injuries. Uh, Eckler got injured. Justin Herbert sustained a bunch of hits. Not a lot of people are really talking about that. He got hit a lot, made a lot of throws under duress. They're going to have to focus on that offensive line. They're going to go with Wyatt Davis here out of Ohio State. I think that he's fallen a little bit just based on, you know, the end of season, how it kind of ended for him getting injured and all that. I think that he's a phenomenal talent here at 47. I know you think highly of him as well, Austin. I think that's a great grab for the Los Angeles Chargers at pick 47. I love that for the Chargers. Obviously, Wyatt Davis is the best, arguably the best run blocker in the class. You could argue him or Sewell, but I think they're very, very close. Love that pick for the Chargers. At 48 here, we have the Oakland, or excuse me, Las Vegas Raiders. I definitely think that we could see them go with um, an edge at this position or interior defensive line. I think interior defensive line is a little more pressing. However, Davion Nixon from Iowa is going to be the pick. Yeah, I really love that for them, actually, uh, in a lot of ways. They need to really focus on, on this team in a lot of different areas. Now, I, I'm very confused by them moving on from some of their offensive linemen. They've kind of opened up a lot of needs there. It's going to be interesting this week in free agency to see how they address some of those new needs that they have created. At pick 49, we have the Arizona Cardinals here now. And I'm looking at the running back position as a really big spot for them. And I'm actually going to opt for Kenneth Gainwell here. I know that the ranking maybe has him a little bit lower, but like you had mentioned, Austin, one of the best pass catching backs in the class, if not the best pass catching back, him and Travis Etienne probably competing for that lone spot at the top there. And I think he brings a little bit of dynamism to that Arizona Cardinal offense where we could see him fly off the board a little bit and really function in that offense for Cliff Kingsbury in a lot of different ways. I think that's a great pick. And I think that's kind of the same projection as a lot of people had Antonio Gibson, very, very similar in terms of how they are as runners and pass catchers. And obviously Antonio Gibson worked out very, very well for Washington. At pick 50 here, I think that Miami is going to be looking at that linebacker spot because with the whole releasing of Calvin, I think that opens up the door for a guy like um, Dylan Moses here. I think that probably fits the best. Dylan Moses is a very, very athletic linebacker. He can do a lot of different things. However, I think he is kind of lazy on some plays and kind of takes a few plays off. But as a whole, I think Dylan Moses has the complete makeup to be a very, very good linebacker at the next level. Yeah, Moses coming into... Uh, the defense there for Brian Flores makes a lot of sense to me. And at 51, I'm looking at Washington here. and I'm going to stick to that wide receiver position. They need to find another guy who can really take some pressure off on that offense. And it's going to be Rondell Moore here out of Purdue. He comes in. He's another nice uh, piece for uh, the Washington football team's offense. And, you know, I've got questions about who's going to be throwing the football for them. Is it going to be Taylor Heineke? Is it going to be a rookie quarterback? I'm not sure yet at this point who's going to be delivering passes for them. But Rondale Moore is going to be a good target for whoever that ends up being. I love that. Rondale Moore, I think if it wasn't for his size, he would be, you know, a much, much higher draft pick in this class. I mean, he overall, he is a pretty good receiver, but that that 5'9 frame does not bode super well at the next level. At pick 52, I think Chicago is going to stay on along that same line of uh, offensive line. So they will go ahead and take a look at the interior. I think Creed Humphrey is probably the best interior offensive lineman available. He is, and I am going to opt for Creed Humphrey. Chicago is going to protect whoever that next quarterback is. I think they're going to end up signing one in free agency or making a trade. 
yeah, I really like that there with him going to the Bears. And at uh, 53 here, I'm looking at the wide receiver position yet again for the Tennessee Titans. I'm a little critical on if Corey Davis is going to be able to stay there in Tennessee. I think he's played himself into a higher price tag than maybe Tennessee's willing to pay for him. I think they're going to opt for Amon Ross and Brown, maybe a little bit of a reach here in terms of what the real talent is, but I think there's not a better fit for Amon Ross and Brown in this draft. He's a real versatile player. He gives you a red zone threat. He's a solid run blocker for a wide receiver. Now, do you want to be drafting wide receivers for their run blocking ability? Not necessarily, but he comes in here to Tennessee. He fits along what they do offensively, and he gives them another pass catcher. Absolutely. I, like we've talked about in the past, I'm going to St. Brown's ability to block could be a little enticing for Tennessee in that regard. At pick 54, we have the Indianapolis Colts. They did not address the offensive tackle spot in the first round, but in the second round, I think regardless of where you want to rank players, I think they have to go with a, a guy like James Hudson or Jackson Carbon. I think Jackson Carbon will get the edge in this. Indianapolis does need to look to replace Anthony Costanzo. They're not going to go, you know, a, a couple more rounds without taking one. It's always tradition for Indy to take an offensive lineman, especially a tackle. Jackson Carmen is the pick. Yeah, they always prioritize that. They do a very good job there in Indianapolis in protecting their quarterback, and that's going to really help Carson Wentz in his time there. 55, I got the Steelers. We're staying right at that offensive tackle spot, Austin, and we're going to go with James Hudson there out of Cincinnati. He's going to be the option. I was actually going to opt for Carbon myself if you went with Hudson anyway. I was hoping for that. He comes here, though, at 55 to the Steelers. I feel pretty good about that. They need to find a long-term option at that left tackle spot to replace Villanueva. Pittsburgh and Indianapolis have that same philosophy of really making sure that their, their front five, you know, are, are very, very solid. So um, interesting to see those two right next to each other, kind of that same draft strategy. Uh, at 56, we have the Seattle Seahawks. Obviously the edge has been an issue for them and they definitely need to go with a guy like Joseph Osai. He's a versatile linebacker slash edge that um, ultimately can get after the quarterback. He doesn't have a ton of moves either. Another one of those guys that needs to refine his game sometimes relies on a little bit of athleticism, but I do think there's some other guys here that very well could go. Joe Tryon has a big physical stature. Um, once again, I, I don't think right now in terms of where his game's at, I, I don't think he's far enough along for Seattle who's trying to contend right now. Osai a little more pro ready. Yeah, this is an interesting spot of the draft too, because Seattle's got some pressure on him from Russell Wilson to go after an offensive lineman. However, the offensive tackle class really itself at this point is thinned out. Los Angeles is in the same situation where they probably want to bring in an offensive tackle to replace Andrew Whitworth, be their long-term franchise starting tackle to protect Matthew Stafford. I just don't really see that being possible at this point though in the class. I think edge is where the Los Angeles Rams are going to be looking to go as well at this point. They need to find uh, a replacement for Leonard Floyd and they're going to opt at this point for Deo Adeni Odeyingbo from Vanderbilt. Sorry, guys, for the mispronunciation there for a second. He comes in for the Los Angeles Rams, and he's going to be a versatile pass rusher for them off the edge. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's the direction they would consider, especially like you had mentioned. I mean, that offensive tackle group really thinned out once you got to this part of the draft. Obviously, having Indy and Pittsburgh ahead of you does not do you any favors in that regard. In the second round here at pick 58, we have the Baltimore Ravens where they're in a kind of a weird spot with where the boards have fallen. We look at the wide receiver position. I think it's definitely time to readdress that wide out spot. Elijah Moore is the best receiver still available in my opinion. I definitely like him going here at 58. Baltimore does need to do a better job putting some more competent receivers around Lamar Jackson. Yeah, I think so as well. Elijah Moore is going to go a long way in doing that. They've got to focus everything that they can right now on helping Lamar Jackson develop as a passer. I think that's really what will take this Baltimore team from a playoff team to a Super Bowl contender. At 59, now I've got the Cleveland Browns, and I'm actually going to opt for Greg Newsom. We've seen him fall a little bit here from Northwestern. And my reasoning on why he goes here now is I don't know if the Cleveland Browns are really confident in what they have with Greedy Williams. We haven't gotten to see him play very much in the last two years because of injury. I think that they're looking to really find a long-term outside corner across from Denzel Ward, who plays at a Pro Bowl level. They need to find someone else who's going to be a big-time player there at that position. Yeah, absolutely. I think they do need to consider that cornerback spot, as does the next team that's sitting here at 60 with the New Orleans Saints, who just cut, who just cut Janoris Jenkins. They have to have another corner ready to go. I think that's Aaron Robinson from UCF. New Orleans is in a really tough situation. They've had to do so many restructures on contracts. They've had to you know, make some tough decisions with their defense. Obviously, Janoris Jenkins was not a part of their long-term future anyway, so it was an easy cut for them. But you do need a corner going into next year. 
Yeah, they really do. And now with the Bills, we got 61 – or, yeah, the Buffalo Bills here at 61 now. They just brought back Matt Milano. Now they're going to go to the wide receiver position, grab Nico Collins. They just cut John Brown. They're going to look for a replacement to him. I think Nico Collins serves as the best opportunity for them. You got Cole Beasley to work out of the slot there. Uh, you got Stephon Diggs, one of the best route runners in the NFL. He's really proved himself in recent years. And now Nico Collins comes in. They need a trio there, and he's going to be the third guy in that trio. Absolutely. I like that pit, that fit for the Buffalo Bills. At Green Bay selection, they went tackle before. Now I think they come back with a wide receiver. And once again, it comes all down to preference. But I think Amari Rodgers is arguably the best receiver here. I also think, for me personally, Tylen Wallace is actually still the, the best available. But I think they would opt to go with Amari Rodgers. Very, very productive career at Clemson. I think that really works well with Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, he comes in. I like that. You get a Rodgers to Rodgers pairing. I, I like that a lot there in Green Bay. And finally, we see Green Bay put a little bit of an emphasis on trying to find that wide receiver two for Aaron Rodgers. So much pressure on Devontae Adams there. They brought back Aaron Jones today. Uh, I like that move for them. But now Amari Rodgers comes in, takes a little bit more pressure off uh, Devontae Adams in that offense. 63, we got the Kansas City Chiefs here. And they're going to go into the interior offensive line and grab Landon Dickerson there out of Alabama. We've seen him fall a little bit. I think that he is a very, very good offensive lineman. I think that he can play at that center position for the Kansas City Chiefs on day one. Maybe you move him to guard early on too. Chiefs have an interesting situation going on with their offensive line. They're going to have to find ways to address it and the draft's going to be the best way for them too. Absolutely. I'd like that selection for Kansas City. Obviously they've had to make some tough decisions along that old line that were cap related. At 64, we have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and we could definitely look at them taking that interior defensive line. J2 Fele was a guy that was once regarded as a you know top 25 selection. Now he falls all the way down here to 64. Um, I, I think that's kind of interesting how a lot of people are sleeping on J2 Fele because he was an opt out. So that will conclude our NFL mock draft second round version. Please let us know in the comment section below who was the steal of the second round. Also leave a like on the video if you did enjoy the content that you saw today. So th thank you so much for tuning in and we cannot wait to see you guys in the next video.